By now, you've heard about our guest lecturer's credentials. You've heard a lot of that. And I don't want to steal too much more of his time. So I'd like to make this introduction more of a personal one. I've known Reverend Dr. Stephen McMullen personally only for a few years. Uh, since I worked with him on an, in an administrative capacity on a research project he was doing with Rave doing his, during his PhD studies at UNB, where I myself studied for an MA in history some time ago. The research project he was administering was on the attitudes and perspectives of seminary students towards domestic violence. I learned a lot about Steve on that project about his holistic approach to ministry, his compassion and empathy for people and their private pains, his desire to equip seminary students to also be empathetic and competent pastors, his rigorous approach to research, and his intellectual depth. Since then, as I've heard him preach and teach, I've come also to recognize his Christ-centered approach to all of life and his deep commitment to Christ's church and to her health and growth. I've profoundly uh, appreciated his support of women in ministry, which is based on a biblical understanding of gifting rather than gender. I was delighted when Steve joined the faculty of ADC. With Steve's biblical and theological grounding, his social science foundations, and his rigorous research of the contemporary church, ADC is well equipped to provide first class training to our students as we work together to prepare pastors to lead churches which witness to the gospel with integrity and relevance in our culture. And by the way, growing up in a family of all girls, at a time when toy trains were seen only as a boy's uh, toy, I am deeply envious of, T of Steve's collection of trains. I always wanted a train set. <laughs> so I now invite Dr. McMullen to come and deliver his final lecture in our series titled Christian Witness in a uh, Postmodern Age. And I'll invite you to join me in prayer. God of truth and love, goodness and beauty, grace and mercy, we thank you for your servant, Steve. We thank you for your church and for the opportunity to be your partners in this world, which you have created with such variety, complexity, and beauty. As we consider this evening how we, the church, might be more effective witnesses to the good news of your love as embodied in Christ Jesus, we pray that you will give Steve the words he needs to communicate and our hearts and minds the receptivity we need to hear the insights you have for us in this mission. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm really not surprised to think that Caroline would be envious of model trains. I would think everyone would be envious of that, so. It's good to see you here tonight, survivors who have stuck with this from the beginning, and I uh, have really appreciated this opportunity to share some things that are really part of my heart, uh, that, are, that are questions that I am processing as I think about the age in which we live and the changes that we are facing as a society and as we think about how as churches we can be effective witnesses. Caroline mentioned a bit about the book table. I just want to say just very quickly and, and really probably should have done this earlier, but there's some books out there that I particularly thought might be helpful to you in terms of these topics that we're looking at. Um, one is entitled Digital Religion, Social Media and Culture. Uh, it's an anthology of of very new um, chapters from a variety of authors and different perspectives as well. I have found that book really helpful to think through some of the questions that I have and particularly 
some of the chapters that think about digital technology from a theological point of view, uh, that hasn't been done very much so far. And I think we need really to have, in a sense, a theology of this digital stuff, to be thinking theologically about these things. So that's why that book is there. There are two books by Chris Smith, uh, one of which I use uh, when I teach evangelism here. It's called Souls in Transition. That really looks at the spiritual uh, lives of young adults. Uh, and then the, the more recent book, even, this just out called Lost in Transition, that looks at some of the uh, consequences of this age in which we're living, how it's affecting the lives of young adults. And then finally, there's a book there called Responding to Abuse in Christian Homes. And Caroline just mentioned the work that I've been involved in for the past number of years with the, uh, it's called RAVE, Religion and Violence E-Learning. It's a research team at the University of New Brunswick, and uh, we've put together a number of books. This one is, uh, uh, again, a collection of, of chapters by various authors, including me. Um, and actually, there's another book that will be out probably within the next couple of months uh, that will look specifically at some of the research that I've been doing in seminaries. So just to give you some sense of why those books are there and how they might be helpful in terms of the topics of these lectures this week. Christian witness in a postmodern age. Although they probably did not realize it, many Christians first encountered postmodern thinking while attempting to build a logical case for Christian belief when talking to an unbelieving friend or relative. I hear these stories quite commonly these days. Having shown the reasonableness of belief in Jesus Christ, with the logical expectation that the hearer would then make a decision to follow Jesus. Christians have been astounded to hear people respond instead with a phrase something like, well, I know that's true for you, but it just isn't true for me. That doesn't fit with our modern understanding of logic, of rational argument, of reason. In fact, we live in a world where an increasing number of people have no problem believing that Jesus is the truth for Christians. That the Koran is the truth for Muslims, the teaching of the Buddha is the truth for Buddhists. In a globalized world that relativizes religions, in fact it relativizes a lot of things, but in a globalized world where, where religion, religious faith, religious views are relativized, Christians who, have, Christians who have based their witness on logical argument, on rational argument, are left bewildered. We're not sure where to go. How do we respond to such a social environment where mutually exclusive statements seem to be accepted as truth? I mean, we know that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. How do we respond to this environment where exclusive statements can all be accepted as truth. Which then provides the possibility of accepting none of the statements, no matter how reasonable and logical they may be. This is a quote from a pastor. As I asked him, what are the greatest challenges that you face in pastoral ministry today? He said, I think being in the postmodern age that we are now, whatever that means like trying to nail jello to the wall, I think, what is truth? Issues of epistemology about how do we know what is true? I think a church needs to be grounded in what is truth? What is it? Well, we do need to be grounded in truth. Certainly, we need to be grounded in the truth of Jesus Christ. But how do we deal with this postmodern mindset? Jean-Francois Jean Lyotard, known as the father of postmodernism, explains, and he explains it actually in a, in a book that was written originally as a report to the Quebec government on the changes that were taking place in society, so it has that Canadian connection. He explains that in computerized societies, he doesn't use the word digital yet because it's back a ways, he says that in computerized societies, the status of knowledge is altered as societies enter what is known as the post-industrial age, the knowledge economy, and cultures enter what is known as the post-modern age. And this change is largely because in a computerized age, knowledge ceases to be an end in itself. 
and becomes a commodity that is produced to be bought and sold. What Leotard calls the mercantilization of knowledge. And we live in that world today. Computerization and a knowledge economy lead to a skepticism that has not been seen before, at least not to the same extent. For example, when you watch the news on TV, do you sit there and think, this is all exactly true? When people respond to the news as portrayed on television or online, they recognize that it may be more than it appears to be. Television networks are seeking to increase their market share so they can charge more for advertising. They choose news items based on that concern. They choose how news will be presented in order to maximize their audience. American audiences especially have learned that the same story on Fox News may be presented quite differently on MSNBC. And the ways it is portrayed online will be different still. As Canadians, we become quite accustomed to seeing the same world news portrayed one way by Canadian news and quite differently on an American station. Both stations are presenting the facts. But their very different social and commercial perspectives means that the facts seem quite different or even contradictory. People echo the words of Pilate. What is truth? Society is witnessing a cultural shift that questions the assumptions of the modern era. Things that were not previously questioned are now being questioned both formally and informally. In many ways, postmodernity is about questions. That should be exciting for the church. I think it is in some ways. I have concerns about postmodern post thinking. But I think it should be exciting for the church to hear questions. After all, as Christians, we've been urged to be prepared to give an answer to those who ask us to give a reason for the hope that we have. Provided that we do so, of course, with gentleness and respect. The problem for the church is that in many cases, we are not ready for those questions. We have statements to make but we're not ready to respond to questions that are asked. We have tied ourselves so closely to the modern way of answering questions with rational argument. We're not prepared for dialogue. The modern world champions progress. Discover the right formula, administer the right program, establish the right institutions, raise enough money, use the proper scientific methods, Find the right kind of leaders. Manufacture the right antibiotic. Invest in the right stocks. And progress will be made in this world. That has been a central idea of Western society since the Enlightenment. And Western society has seen a lot of progress since the invention of the printing press enabled modern ideas to predominate in society's thinking. In many ways, the Christian church became modern and worked for progress right along with those social institutions. The gospel, however, predates the modern era, era by many centuries. The world of Jesus and of the early church was far from modern. Some parts of the Western church have so embraced modernity that it is as if one has to be modern to be Christian. Churches labored to become modern institutions, concerned with governance, impressive edifices, meetings that follow Robert's rules of order. Secular ideas about leadership were combined with successful programs, success meaning growth and prosperity. Real estate was purchased, impressive buildings with stained glass and pipe organs were constructed, constitutions were written, endowment funds were raised to ensure a healthy future for the institution. In a modern world, who would have questioned such things? Churches followed organizational management principles to produce results to make progress, 
And their leaders wrote books to tell others how to do it based on their results. Church leaders wanted books with titles like 10 Easy Ways to Grow Your Church, Five Simple Steps for Church Health. That was the modern way of thinking. What modernity did not tolerate well were things like mystery and the miraculous. The Holy Spirit does not fit well into modern thinking. And the Spirit of God is actually pretty important in Christian doctrine. If we are to be true to the Christianity of the Bible, modernity is actually a problem. The most obvious result of the clash between the Bible and modernity was the attempt by some theologians of modernity to remove the miraculous from Christianity, to swallow the modern possibility structure and excise any aspects of Christianity that do not fit. Modernity became the measure of biblical truth for some people. If the church was to be modern, it had to move beyond any ties to its pre-modern past, which of course includes belief in such things as the resurrection. In what social scientists now often refer to as late modernity or even ultra-modernity, what is popularly referred to as post-modernity, there are new and perplexing questions in society. And I hope what I've shown is that that is not all bad. Centuries of progress seem not to have solved humanity's problems. In fact, progress has caused new problems and new risks. Education has not eradicated crime or poverty or injustice. Domestic violence is an epidemic in modern society. Science has discovered and produced new substances to which humans can become addicted. Governments hide corruption. Depression and stress and loneliness and mental illness affect increasing numbers of people because of, not in spite of, the modern age and its demands for efficiency and rationalization. And especially, family relationships have become much less stable in the modern world, particularly in the last few decades. Many churches that most enthusiastically embraced modernity do not satisfy their own members, especially their younger members, and they do not attract the unchurched. <laughs> Great church edifices, marvels of modern design and construction whose interiors are crowded with memorial plaques, stand nearly empty on Sunday mornings, save for a few seniors. When I did my study of declining congregations, I saw this over and over and over. All of the accomplishments and achievements of the modern world cannot create spiritual vitality. And churches without spiritual vitality do not interest the generation of postmoderns. Many of the essential aspects of modern church life, everything from business meetings to hierarchical bureaucratic structures to budget processes, have become spiritual barriers that repel or at least confuse the unchurched. What is especially difficult for congregations today is that in this rapidly changing society, some aspects of congregational life that used to be considered strengths have now become weaknesses. Let me provide a few specific examples from my own congregational research. The first is related to what sociologists call strong ties or bonding capital. Churches that seek to be a close-knit group of people. Modern wisdom was that building a tightly st structured organization with strong social ties would ensure the long-term health of a congregation. But strong ties among church members have instead made many established congregations seem impenetrable to people in an increasingly mobile society. Increasing numbers of people who move from community to community or even from continent to continent without putting down deep roots 
Do not find it easy to connect meaningfully with congregations whose identities are entwined with shared histories and intergenerational family ties. Nor do the people in closely knit congregations find it easy to connect with people who do not share their story and their local traditions. In just very practical ways. I can remember having focus groups in some of these declining congregations and asking about whether new people ever come to their church. And they would respond by saying, sometimes we've had strangers come. Because their fellowship so close was an exclusive fellowship. The sense of closeness and family that makes some established congregations so attractive and enjoyable for long-standing members makes those same congregations seem socially distant for those who understand little of the shared history or tradition. In a different day, when religious congregations were at the center of the social life of their stable communities, where everyone knew everyone, strong ties were an important asset. Everyone knew they belonged. In the contemporary world marked by increasing individualism, mobility, and change, those same strong ties have become a major liability. When ties among members in a congregation are simply human ties of common interest or opinion, it is inauthentic to the surrounding culture that insists on something more, something that expresses the spiritual ideals about which churches speak. And one of the, the, the ways in which this shows itself so clearly, I think, is in what has happened to church membership. What does it mean to be a member of a congregation? I remember a focus group in one congregation, uh, about 90 people on Sunday morning in a sanctuary that seated, I think, around 375, they told me. And as they talked about what it meant to be a member, this is what one of the deacons said. He said... If our entire membership showed up, they would not all find seats. On our rolls, we have 800 or so. Again, they're averaging 90 on Sunday. But the number we really think of is more in the 400 range. That seats 300 to 350 in there. What's happened here? You see... They thought that just putting people on the roll, on the membership roll, made them part of the community. It did not. It takes more than that for people to be part of a community. Being so connected with Christ that His life becomes our life, our shared life, our common life. That is what should connect us to one another because as believers who have experienced salvation, we all share the Christ life. That's what I was talking about in chapel this morning. Church ties should be based on spiritual connection, a common relationship with Jesus Christ, not just on friendship, not just on shared human interest, not just that our name is written on a roll somewhere. Modern churches emphasize that they are friendly. Their ushers have gone to a welcoming seminar. But you see, any human organization can be friendly. Any human organization can teach technique. Technique is no longer enough in contemporary society. But when the church truly is the church... It can bridge human differences like no other organization because of our common relationship with Jesus Christ. Robert Putnam, in his famous book, Bowling Alone, argues that the, the main reason for the sudden rise and great success of many contemporary megachurches is not their programming or their size or their technique. He argues that because they attract such a diverse group of worshipers. In fact, he says they're the most diverse social organizations that exist in the United States today. He says because they attract such a diverse group of worshipers in terms of age, race, and cultural background, if they do not make their common spiritual connection the central tie that holds the church together, it will all fall apart. 
rather than strong ties with one another, an emphasis on our common relationship with Jesus builds bridges among otherwise remarkably disparate people. A second thing that in the modern world was seen as an asset is money. Do you have a rich church? The remarkable ability of faithful members of many established congregations several decades ago to donate and then invest quite substantial amounts of money in order to provide endowment funds to meet future institutional expenses, especially building maintenance expenses, must have seemed at that earlier time to have been a major accomplishment that would ensure that these modern congregations would always thrive and prosper. Instead, those funds serve to preserve outdated traditions and to prevent or at least delay the kinds of changes that would have been necessary for those congregations to provide effective and relevant witness in their changing communities. I was shocked and amazed. I remember, uh, again, one church, they told me that they had gone from about 600 and down to they're around 150, 175 when I visited. And I, and I asked the pastor, how has this affected finances? He said, well, it really doesn't matter. He said, we have $6 million in an endowment fund. Another church told me they had $5 million. Well, it was the church that was down to 90 people on Sunday morning. They had $5 million, their pastor told me, in their endowment fund. But I said, well, <laughs> I won't find that here in the Maritimes. And so I would say to pastors, you know, well, you know, some of the churches I've gone to have had have these big endowment funds, but I know that, that your church doesn't. And they'd say, well, no, we just have a few hundred thousand dollars in our endowment funds here in the Maritimes. Endowment funds provide political power within the life of the congregation to people who possess financial acumen and investment skills. It provides power to major donors and their relatives thereby preventing the priorities of new and younger members or even pastors from influencing the congregation's overall agenda and direction. Endowment funds enable such congregations to weather the early years of decline without making the changes that could have been made at the time when the congregation still had the people and resources to enact meaningful and effective changes. Young people start leaving and people say, so what? We don't need them. We don't need to change. Many years later, with aging and shrinking congregations and outdated buildings in need of considerable maintenance and repair, endowment funds start to be depleted. In fact, what I discovered was congregations begin to borrow from the endowment fund. That's how, I mean, the endowment fund is left for specific purposes, not for the general operation of the church, but they begin to borrow from that fund for the general operation. It's very clear in their annual report they're going to pay this back someday after they're all dead. <laughs> the endowment funds become depleted at a time when there are not enough members left to meet the regular expenses of the congregation or to provide the ministries that they need to provide in order to be a witness to their community. Those financial assets turn out to be a liability that prevents change at a time when such change could have made a difference. Growing churches have an entirely different outlook regarding money. When I asked one pastor if his growing church had any endowment funds, he laughed at me. He said, it's not that we're against having a little pot for a rainy day. The problem would be for us that there is too much vision to finance. So if there was a pot, the pot would be getting drained because we want to achieve the vision. From his perspective, declining congregations have money in the bank, not because they're good financial managers, but because they have no vision. They have prioritized financial management ahead of witness. In 27 years of pastoral ministry, I can remember two years where we met the budget. Both of those times, we immediately raised the budget for the following year. In none of those churches were there endowment funds. I think they would have destroyed our faith and limited our vision to do new things 
and they would have tied us to the past. That isn't quite so bad when times change very slowly. But in this age of rapid social change, being tied to the past is deadly for congregations and for their witness to others. In my course about church renewal, I require that students read a short online article by George Bullard. It's entitled, and this explains the article. Your congregation is more likely to exist ten years from now if it has no dependence on endowment. In today's changing society, endowment funds are likely to lead to the death of a congregation. What happens is finances begin to drive the church. I remember being invited to, to go to a session meeting at one church that had pretty well depleted its endowment funds. The congregation was very small. So I went to their, their session meeting and the moderator began by saying to me, I'm sorry this isn't going to be a very interesting meeting for you to attend. He said, we have no time to discuss, me, uh, to discuss ministry because we've got to think about fundraising for our whole meeting tonight or else the church isn't going to be able to stay open for another year. He wasn't really thinking about what he was saying. The only, reason, the only way that church was going to remain open is if they stopped talking about finances and began thinking about ministry. But finances changes the priorities. And then there are church buildings. Many established congregations have large and impressive buildings that reflect the sacrifice and devotion of a previous generation who determined to construct worship spaces that are among the most outstanding buildings in their communities. In the modern age, Many congregations built large buildings to impress rather than for effective witness. They built buildings to, to fit their Christmas Eve crowd. Now these shrinking congregations are disadvantaged because of their aesthetically beautiful and architecturally significant buildings that were designed for a large congregation. Rows of straight wooden pews. between stained glass memorial windows facing a platform designed for one-way communication from leader to congregation. Such church buildings are not the kinds of worship spaces that are practically suited for the utilization of modern technology or for a less formal style of worship or for a smaller congregation or for the kind of conversation and dialogue expected in an age of question. The congregation I mentioned last night where they've decided to have no screens, the technology-free morning service, removed all of the pews from their large building, put a table in the middle of the space, and put their chairs around the table. As the pastor said, we look at Christ and we see the other members. It's meant for conversation. The once impressive large buildings, now mostly empty, but still needing to be heated and maintained, and some of the churches that I met with told me they had to meet in their basement in the, in the winter because they couldn't afford to heat the large sanctuary. Those buildings have become a liability and a weekly reminder of the extent of the decline in attendance. In one declining congregation that has since closed its doors, I asked the focus group what one change they thought might make the biggest difference in their church. Quite quickly, they agreed that, that the biggest thing that they could do, the most important thing they could do, would be to remove the rows of straight, hard pews. They said that would make the church feel more inviting and less formal. And it wouldn't make it look as empty on Sunday either. So then I asked them if they thought they might make that change. They were all trustees and deacons in this focus group. And they unanimously agreed that no way would they do that. The building could not be changed. It would be better to close than change the pews. And so they closed. Another strange thing that used to be an asset 
is related to community ministries. In, the, in this age of questions, the community takes note of a church that has a vibrant love for the community and a desire to meet social and physical needs as well as spiritual needs. Few things speak more to the genuineness of the spiritual life of a church than the ways that we love and welcome the disadvantaged in the surrounding community. The problem, though, that I found in my research is that such ministries can become institutionalized and then continue without the same spiritual vibrancy they take on a life of their own and it's not a particularly spiritual life they can even become a substitute purpose for a congregation the church becomes a social service agency which is seen as inauthentic to the community I think of one congregation that began to tell me about the tremendous program they had for feeding the homeless in their city they told me how many people came and how many meals were served. And so I began to ask about who was involved, who was giving leadership, and I discovered before long that actually no one from the church was involved in that ministry. It had started out decades ago as a church ministry, but they had institutionalized it. They put together the board, the structure, everything that was needed. And now the program just continues with the church giving it space. I found other churches that had begun ministries and actually those ministries were now paying the church rent to use the building. Reggie McNeil talks about the importance of making the church building a place of gathering for the community. Such use of a church building can be a powerful witness. In some congregations though, the use of the church building by the community reduces the members interest in being personally involved in witness because the building does it for them. Then churches may look to ways to use the building to provide rental income. Eventually the building becomes the witness of the church, at least in people's minds, with programs often led and carried out by non-members. Assets have become liabilities. Postmodern people ask questions. Where is the meaning in this? Where is the meaning in your endowment funds? Where is the meaning in your impressive buildings? Bigger and better sounded good in a modern world. Impressive signs of progress and success, but not in a postmodern world where genuine Christ-likeness is more likely to be appreciated. In many ways, evangelical Christianity has linked itself with modern culture, I think. Evangelical publishing houses and recording studios founded as ministries by devout Christians to serve the needs of Christian authors and musicians became profitable subsidiaries of multinational corporations. Sometimes evangelicals' arguments about the truth of Christianity center not so much on divine revelation as on rational argument. Just as evangelicals were embracing modernity, <laughs> the larger society began to question modernity. Science had not ended in justice and suffering, and there's no prospect that it will. Science has, in fact, created a world filled with new risks and problems. Evil has not been eradicated by the modern world. Families experience pain as relationships do not follow logical paths. Medicine has its limits in curing the human condition. Attempts to reduce the great questions of humanity to logical argument are unsatisfying or even maddening. People still suffer. People still die. People are still lonely. Injustice continues. Sanitized Christianity is a product of the modern world. Churches can become spaces in which we dress up to look our best. More than once I've been startled to find out that domestic violence was hiding in the homes of people who walked into church with smiles on their faces, looking their best. Churches and their desire to show that they've progressed in the modern age sought to portray their members in a good light. A few years ago I was visiting a, a city in the United States as part of the religion and violence research team. During my visit with staff at the local battered women's shelter, 
I mentioned that I had appointments to talk about domestic violence with a number of clergy in the city. And so a social worker asked if I would be visiting one very large mainline church. They confided in me that several women from that congregation had sought their help and that some women from the congregation were currently receiving assistance from the shelter, but they said they'd had no success in making any connection with that congregation. Well, I was meeting with their pastor. So when I, when I met with him and began talking with him about how churches might respond to the needs of their members who are victims of domestic violence, he stopped me. He said, what do you mean, church members who are victims of domestic violence? And I said, well, I mean, our research has made clear that it's a major problem in, in churches across denominational lines. And he said to me, I have been the pastor of this church for nine years. And in all that time, because of the high level of education in this congregation, there has never been a case of domestic violence here. He had clearly signaled, or his congregation had clearly signaled to their members, keep your problems hidden. Keep your problems to yourself. We have an image to care for. They were making their hurting members play, let's pretend. And I'm afraid that was in many ways part of the modern world, part of Christianity in the modern world. Let's pretend. When we make our members pretend when they attend our church, we not only damage the lives of people, such as victims of domestic abuse, who need the church's guidance to seek help, but we ruin the church's witness to people within those families and to the surrounding community. Postmodern thinking will not tolerate, let alone promote, such pretense. There was no pretense with Jesus. There could not be. There should be no pretense in the church. It is a cultural shift to think that displaying our faults, thus praising God's grace, is a more powerful witness than a well-behaved church community where manners and etiquette are carefully adhered to. I think here we have some things to learn from a variety of churches and denominations that implicitly reject the narrow rationality of modernity. In a society where major institutions say, let's pretend they don't exist with regards to issues like poverty and injustice and prejudice, it is very refreshing to a watching world to see churches that encourage people to be themselves and to ask hard questions. Authentic, spiritually vital Christianity speaks to people regardless of the social conditions and it shouldn't be tied only to modern ways of thinking and understanding. In a modern world, witness is limited to the propositional content of our message and that propositional content, I believe, is important. It was important certainly in terms of what Jesus taught. However, the reason people listened to Jesus was not just his propositional content. It was who he is. It was his compassion, his holiness, his understanding. The way he challenged the institutions and authorities of the day, it was the fact that he loved them. And it wasn't because his religion told him he had to. He genuinely loved people, and they knew it. As we are preparing our logical arguments, our rational arguments about Christianity, about the Bible, do the people that we are arguing with know that we love them? For people who have a postmodern way of thinking, that will be essential. Many Christians seem to talk about postmodernity with fear, with the sense that it is to be vigorously opposed. And certainly, I worry about the relativism that is often characteristic of postmodern thinking. But I think we should listen to the new questioning of Christianity with hope, with the sense that this change brings new opportunity. In this time of massive social transitions, there are questions being asked that give Christians new opportunities to be part of the dialogue 
as long as we're willing to listen as well as to speak. The church will have to speak in a way that answers the questions of the day, not in a way that answered our questions in a different period of time. I think this speaks directly to the desire for churches to reach contemporary young youth and young adults because many of them think in postmodern ways. They question things that are considered truth. Digital technology facilitate, facilitates such teaching because it is a different focus than the logical scientism of modernity. Digital media allow people to connect and cross barriers that institutions could formally impose. It might be simple things like our ability to control what people read, which books are in the church libraries I mentioned last night, those sorts of things. But now the information is on the internet. It may have to do with relationships. We could in the past tell our members what Muslims and Hindus were like because they probably would never meet such a person. And we sounded authoritative as we gave them our truth. Now they can talk to their co-worker, their fellow student, their neighbor. It wasn't that we caricatured their beliefs, I don't think. I think perhaps we quite accurately described their beliefs. But as people question, they discover neighbors who also have compassion. Neighbors who also love their families. Neighbors of other religious faiths who are nice to them. Who may have experienced tremendous prejudice at the hands of Christians. In today's secular world, Faith is not judged based on how well it aligns with rational ideas. Today the question is, does it work? Is it genuine? Do I experience God? Do these people who call themselves Christians, do they really love? Or is it just a doctrinal belief they have to follow? Are they all about money? Are they all about buildings? These are very different types of questions in our secular world today. In a relativized, uncertain world, and this is a very uncertain world, the gospel offers certainty. The gospel is truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. But if we try to communicate that purely in terms of modern rational thinking, people are not going to listen to us. People want certainty. Postmodern people want certainty. But they will not receive and believe based on our debating skills or our logical arguments. It will be received based on how our lives and our churches align with the message. Well, Steve has certainly offered us some provocative thoughts, and I'm sure there are questions. If you would like to ask Steve a question, I remind you to come directly to the mic and speak into it. We want to record the question as well as the answer. My goodness. I, oh, okay. I was ready to ask myself. <laughs> Dr. Wooden. Steve, I'm curious about something. All right. Last night you talked about the, um, the approach to technology. And you proposed that uh, rather than jettison or adopt whole hog, the better way was to think it through well. Right. Tonight, with things like endowments, you take a very different slant. Rather than say, adopt whole hog, you say, jettison, and you don't talk about think through very well. Well, why not the same for buildings and endowments? This may be a conversation we have that carries on, but uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Okay, my quick thought is, I think that the things I've talked about tonight become substitutes 
for the real thing, if I can put it that way. I think that may happen with technology, but I don't think necessarily. I, I want to say, and uh, yeah, in my research, I encountered no instances of churches with large endowment funds where that had not replaced faith. Now, if a church can do it, I think, fine. I'm just not sure how it's possible. And I go back to, for example, the pastor I quoted saying, you know, if we had more money, <laughs> there are billions of people who are lost in this world. Why would we be investing it? We would need to be starting more ministries. So uh, that's my concern, that it's, it's, that it's that sense of we are going to provide for the future so that once you know, we are no longer giving, once we are no longer here, once whatever's happening, the ministry of the church will continue without any need for faith, without any need for God. That's not a good thing. Um, and I'm probably being a little too negative. Um, I have just not seen situations where churches have used endowment funds well. And the situations I have seen really have led to the deaths of those congregations. That's what I would say. It's not just that it hurts the church in some way. It leads to the church dying. Yeah. Okay, quick yeah. follow-up. In your, in your research on the congregations, did you look at a range of healthy churches as well that not, had endowment funds? Yeah. No, I, I really did not. I didn't look at a range. I, lo I had some healthy congregations. <laughs> None of them had endowment funds, and I didn't know that when I chose this congregation. So I'd be interested in finding some healthy churches that have endowment funds. That would be very helpful in terms of my thinking this through. So if you know of some, yeah, thank you. Hey, that's Scott. Steve, you, uh, you talked about com uh, questions a lot tonight, mm -hmm. giving people a chance to ask questions. You also certainly affirmed that we have to continue to proclaim truth. So yes. I'm assuming yes. that on Sunday mornings, we're not often going to be getting rid of sermons and proclamations. That's right. Did you find any churches that, can you give us any examples of what some churches are doing to facilitate giving space to questions, like digitally or yeah. informally in the church or whatever? I mean, the, the most common way you've just answered that question, that is digitally. I certainly have seen questions that, that provide opportunity online. For people to ask questions and be part of a dialogue. Um, I did not witness this, but I also was at churches that told me that they have had panels of people, some of whom were not believers, and, and they did that precisely to help their congregation understand some of the, converse, the spiritual conversations that were going on in their community. To say that didn't happen when I was visiting those congregations, but they did tell me that they did do that. And these were certainly growing, strongly evangelical congregations that had decided that they needed to do that. Um, just trying to think if there are any other examples that I can think of. I would, the only other thing I can say is for members, and this is also using digital technology, I would say some churches have used um, digital technology to communicate to their members well. Some of, the, some of the questions that are there. Uh, that's probably not that new. I think some churches have tried to do that through the arts and through drama for some time, but, but I think that continues at least and is maybe used, using, done more using digital technology. Yeah. Yes. Stephen, you spoke last night about uh, information, uh, among other things, and the digital side of things, and this evening you spoke about uh, postmodernity as questioning. I would add to that perhaps also um, the importance of experience yes. and the yes. search for personal experience. Yes. So as we kind of look at this glut of information that we're still trying to process and this response to modernity, um, what place is there and how can churches find a place for that element of, of mystery that might speak to people's questioning and need for an experience of the divine? That's an excellent question. And it's interesting because I think, and I'm really in some ways talking about myself and my own experience. I think in some ways in our churches, we downplayed mystery. Um, and I think we made a mistake in doing that. Uh, I think that 
uh, the wonder of the gospel. Much of the gospel is really mystery. We try to take some events in the New Testament, uh, well, I'm thinking of the life of Jesus, and, and we try to sort of make them into not that big a deal. Yeah, there was a miracle there sort of thing. Wow. Um, these are mysteries that, that are powerful, I think, that, that, that say something of the power of God and our limitedness in light of who God is. I think our world, I think people uh, around us realize that there are a lot of things that no one really understands well. And for us to act like we understand it all is not that helpful in terms of our witness. So uh, I agree. I think mystery is, I mean, the God's grace itself is, is a mystery. And I know we can say, well, we can look through Scripture and, you know, doctrinally categorize all these things. Why in the world does God love me? That is a mystery. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful mystery and a wonder. Lois is up. Hi, Steve. Uh, first, I apologize for my phone. It's a smartphone, but it hasn't <laughs> learned to read my mind yet. Um, anyway, uh, I'm just, I was following you right to the very end. Okay. And I'm just wondering if I heard you correctly to say that the postmodern people with a postmodern mindset do want certainty. I think they do, yes. I think they're skeptical about whether they can find it. Mm -hmm. But I think they do want certainty. I, I, personally, I think that's part of the human condition that we mm -hmm. would like to find certainty. I think there's a real, um, and even skepticism isn't a strong enough wor word, a real um, a disillusionment mm -hmm. with uh, people who claim to have certainty. And so I think if we, if, if our response is to say, well, we have the truth, that's, that's not meeting their need. But I think there is a human need that we have for certainty. But again, it's not going to come from our sort of proclamation, we found it and just take it. Uh, I think that they need to walk through the experience of, of discovering what faith is and, and all of those things that I think somehow we sort of took out of the formula that we had of, you know, do these four things and you quickly become a Christian or baptized. Uh, I think they may need to work through a number of things to really understand that Jesus is the truth in the way that hopefully we understand. Oh, it's that certainty that you meant. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. <laughs> okay, that does actually change because I'm, I was thinking, <laughs> honestly. What did you think I meant? <laughs> no, I, I was thinking, you know, we talk about quite, you had started at the beginning with saying the questioning and, yes. and, and I think that as, um, a mode of learning that the dialogical kind of method, um, one question leads to another, that often when people ask a question, postmoderns ask a question, I would argue that they're not really looking for an answer. Right. They're looking for a conversation, and you, you had mentioned that. Yes. Um, okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm not prepared to argue with you on the point that they are yearning for a certainty that they will find in Christ. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> okay, Chuck. Uh, Steve, a lot of us are dealing with churches where the majority are moderns. Sure. And sure. you better know Rogers, Rogers' Rule of Order if you're going and to I, deal look, with it. I don't have any something against Rogers' Rules of Order, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> no, neither do I. I've unfortunately have to drive I just that don't out think it should drive the mission of the church. No. Um, I get a really strong sense though these people have made these things that you discussed tonight their Christian experience. And to remove them is to invalidate their Christian life. Uh, a lot of that I'm hearing about how to move the church forward seems to be seems to imply though not directly state just leave them behind. Is there somebody is there somebody providing resources to help us bring those moderns along and discover a fuller Christian experience? Uh, well, I, I think that, um, I go back, I mentioned Reggie McNeil. I think Reggie McNeil does an excellent job of, of talking not just in, I mean, I've talked as if there are two groups of people. He says there are six generations living right now, uh, and they all have different ways of understanding these things. I think that's very helpful. It's helpful to church leaders to understand that. And it may be helpful to some of those people also to begin to understand why their way of looking at things that 
has to do with things like the Second World War and so on. I mean, it, it really ch changed in terms of, you know, their sense of building and seeking to achieve and, and, and memorialize things. The reasons that are not bad reasons at all why they have that mindset, but they may not understand why they have that mindset and why these younger people don't realize. Um, they, and, and it's simply a matter of helping them to understand. Uh, so I think that's perhaps a resource. I certainly also want to affirm, and I hope this has been true in my pastoral ministry, I think it has been, where, um, I mean, certainly Main Street, <sighs> change was continual, and I mean, it, there was a lot of change in the 10 years that I was there. And, and I thanked the people there, uh, who were there when I first went there, many, many times for their graciousness in allowing that. And I don't think the answer is to try to sort of pull the rug out from people and say it's not your church anymore, or the young people are taking over. That's, that's not very Christian, you know, quite simply, I would say. But I also think that it's important to help some of those people with that modern way of thinking to think new thoughts. And that takes some patience, it takes some teaching. And many times it takes... Um, Opportun providing opportunities for them to experience what God can do through them in ways that maybe they have not realized before. Um, I think some people uh, began to have the sense that, you know, it's the programs that are doing it. I'm, I'm nothing. You know, we've got the programs and so it's doing it. To help people see how Christ is working through them and really to affirm that uh, in, in any way that we can, I think is really important to help them to see that it's actually about, again, the, the, the spiritual life, the vitality, the connection to Christ, the, the Holy Spirit at work within them. That those are the things that, uh, that, that help them to realize what being, being a church is. It's not the building with the plaque of their grandfather. Uh, it's that they are part of the body of Christ. So part of that's teaching, part of that's patience, part of that's giving people opportunities to see how God can work through them so that they really begin to see that themselves. Okay, John, I think you had a question. First an observation, Steve, is that uh, it seems that a theme implicit in a lot of what you're saying is recovering hospitality. Yes. Whether it's yes. digitally or in other ways. Yes. And mm. one of my observations returning to the Maritimes after living uh, away for a while is that we're very good at hospitality as an industry and often, depending on the family situation, sometimes hospitality within family. But hospitality, we even have terms like come from away and other things that really betray that we're not too great at hospitality to those who are new or visiting or a guest. And, and I guess what I'm struggling with is that the modernity mindset would be hospitality is a technique. You know, how does everybody smile well as a greeter or whatever that's really a, a modernist mindset there, whereas what I hear you saying, implicitly a lot of what you're saying, is that hospitality is really a virtue, a spiritual practice, a state of heart to welcome the other person on the journey to dialogue together. And I was wondering if you could expand on the role of hospitality, not only as a practice, but also um, an attitude or a virtue that shapes how we engage people in our day. I mean, certainly it's biblical. I mean, very clearly, hospitality is something that the Bible talks about. And I think one of the neat things, too, I mean, I think we used to live in a more hospitable society, at least when I talk with seniors about when they were younger. Um, they talk about much more... I mean, uh, my mother, who's now 93, uh, talks about... Uh, I've heard her say on a number of occasions that she cannot remember when she was a child any Sunday when they either did not have other people in for dinner or they went to someone else's house for dinner. We have to understand my mother was one of nine children, so that's 11 in the family, which was common in their community. And I, I remember saying to my mother, as she was saying this one time, I said, who would invite a family of 11 to their house for dinner? And she said, well, you know, probably another family of 11. Or, you know, we would invite them to our house. So I think part of it was, it was, it was a more hospitable day in some ways. And, and so church hospitality, hospitality of Christians toward others, 
was just part of the social fabric. I think today we have an opportunity to stand out because we do not live in a society where there's hostility. I mean, back to Robert Putnam's book, Bowling Alone. He talks about how few people invite anyone ever into their homes. It's a very different world. Our homes are, are our sort of barrier now instead of a place for inviting people to get to know us and us get to know them. So I think we can actually begin to help our people to see this is an opportunity to stand out. We have to get over the barrier of my house isn't nice enough, it's not clean enough, you know, we work all week, we don't have time to, to get things. Um, there was a book that's now, I'm sure, long out of print. Um, what was it called? How to Build a Caring Sharing Fellowship, I think it was called. And I remember the author said, um, as they, he tried to get people to invite people into their homes, and this is what they'd say. They'd say, well, I can't do that because our home is so small. And so on. he said he discovered that the greatest places for hospitality were either mobile homes or small apartments. Because he said people would go there and they'd be so crowded that they wouldn't sit, which meant that they actually talked to one another. You know, they had these people with these sort of mansion-like homes, great big living rooms. Everyone in, they sat in the plush chairs and they looked at one another uh, because they really still weren't interacting. So I think we have to get people over that sense of, you know, if I had the big mansion, I would do this, but unfortunately in my apartment, I can't. I think also um, we need to help people... invite a diverse group of people. So instead of just saying, you know, who are the people just like me that I'd be most comfortable with? To say, um, I think I should find some people that probably if I didn't invite them, I would never have an opportunity to have a conversation with them. Uh, I think that would be very helpful. I think that... Uh, I think that across culturally and... and, and Again, in terms of people of other world religions. Uh, many times we're not going to get a hearing unless there's some hospitality first where we show we would welcome them at our table and share a meal with them. And, and that includes thinking through their dietary rules and all those things and showing a willingness to accommodate them. Uh, that that, that the, the love of Christ in us is willing for us to be careful to make sure that, that we do not make them uncomfortable in those ways. I think those are all aspects that can then provide opportunity for witness today. And as I say, I just don't see that in our society happening very much at all. Just out of the uh, number of books on hospitality that I have, an excellent one, which is out of print, but you could still get it used, is by Marlene Lefevre. And I think it's called just hospitality. Okay. Okay. So I do want, uh, I need to give Glenn time because I forgot at the beginning. Um, and we want some time for um, hospitality among ourselves tonight. So I will give uh, Dr. McRae the last question. Steve, uh, as, you, as you can tell, I've been sitting way back here and not paying, I've been paying great attention, of course. Um, as your predecessor in teaching evangelism and mission yes. here for so many years, I have a passionate interest in evangelism and in apologetics, as it happens. Deep, deep interest, because I've taught it for so often, so long. But now, what I'm a little afraid of tonight, it has been a great session. I've enjoyed it thoroughly, and I'm sure others have. And you've stimulated us to ask all kinds of questions. I think we've gone until midnight Good. quite easily tonight. That would not be a difficulty. But I find myself saying, what place in your heart do you have for those churches which don't match the postmodernist yeah. mold, as I'm going to call it for the moment? Yeah. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration or two. For example, I have preached many times in First Baptist Church Vancouver through various ministries and through dynamic outreach yes. to its community. Um, and yet it maintains degrees of formality that certainly don't fit with what you've been talking tonight. Um, or, even more extreme, one of my favorite churches in Toronto is Yorkminster Park Baptist Church, where I've preached many times. It's a very exciting church. And yet it's very formal when you enter and 
and acquire processes and all this kind of stuff. And you think, what in the world is going on here? And then you discover, now this is, this is a sideshow really, but then you discover that this church has initiated the whole program of Out of the Cold and has reached out to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of street people over many years. Or I think of its, its vision um, even today for adapting its life and putting its... Inv- now, it's a church with heavy endowments. But I want to tell you... <laughs> so there, let's, I need to research that church. <laughs> well, I yeah. tell you, yeah. it has used endowments in the most spectacular way. And when the last pastor I worked with there, uh, Kerr Spears, who was in, from Scotland and had gone back there after his retirement, he was so thrilled by the way in which that church, with its vast resources compared with others, invested these in people in the inner city. Yeah. Yeah. And when his ministry started, the contrast with the, the ministry of the late Dr. John Gladstone, whom we all admired greatly, in fact, we have a John Gladstone chair here, which I'm happy to say I tried to sponsor for years before it got going. Um, but, you know, I think what, what that church has done, in fact, and what it's done in the community. In John Gladstone days, it was regarded as a fashionable church. People came from everywhere. They came from Montreal. They came from all over the center of the country to listen to John Gladstone, the man with a silver tongue. And then came Kerr Spears, a complete contrast. Now Kerr didn't even try to placate or facilitate or, or how can I put it, mollify the sort of sophistication of the moneyed crowd. He was very accomplished in that area. And in fact, at one point during his ministry, because I called him one day, I said, How's your campaign going? Oh, he said, Andrew, campaign, never mind. He said, 18 months ago, we told the church we needed $2 million to revamp the whole place and extend our ministries to the community. And he said, we got the whole lot from the congregation in 18 months. And he said, I still can't believe it. Now, what do you make? Of, and these are extreme churches, I know that. Extreme examples. But do you really allow place in the way Absolutely. you talk about yeah. postmodernism, yeah. for the legitimacy and the authenticity yeah. of the ministry of churches of the East yeah. Let me say a couple of things uh, that are important, I think. The first is, I do not want any church to fit into the postmodern mold. I want to make that clear. What I do want is for churches to understand the change in the environment around them, among those that are not believers. Uh, so I, I just want to make that clear. It's not that I want churches to become postmoderns. I say uh, that involves a relativism that I don't want to see in the church. But I think we do have to understand that relativism in the society around us. The second thing I hope that I haven't said is, because I think this is really a matter of style and so on, and I don't think that really matters. Um, I don't see that formal or informal is an issue in any way. Uh, I think that there, I, I would hope that uh, particularly in, in large cities like you've mentioned, that there would be a variety of styles of worship and ministry that would be attractive to a, a different, uh, a, a diverse group of people. So I, I, would, I would affirm that and, and hope that would be the case. In fact, I'm quite interested in some congregations where they have more than one service and often have different styles even among those services. Some very, I guess we'd say, you know, high church, very formal, and then an hour later they have a service that is not so much uh, because they recognize that they have a, a, a different group of people that they want to reach. Um, and you have brought up the issue that was going through my mind even as, as Glenn was asking me the question, and that is, I wonder if churches would um, dedicate endowment funds to mission, if it would be different. The problem is I've never seen that in the churches that I studied. And I, I've been to a number of churches and they all, the money was all going to preservation, if I can put it that way. It was keeping up the building, keeping up whatever. Um, and so I've wondered that, particularly if there, if there, you know, in some congregations you might have someone 
who gives, you know, maybe when they die, for example, there's a very large bequest. Um, churches tend to take that money and invest it for the building. What if they took that money instead and invested it for missions? So if that's the case, I would be interested in that. So thank you. Yeah.